So You Can Play That Game is proudly sponsored by NiceGameShop.com, the place to go for rare and unusual Asian games. Hi, I'm Michael and welcome to my top 10 games of all time. And this is as of July 2017 and frankly this has been one of the hardest things I've ever had to do make this list because there are just so many fantastic games that I absolutely love and I'm one of these people who the amount I love a game kind of varies quite a lot depending on just the mood I'm in, what I actually want, you know, if I want a short filler I'll be like yeah this game filler yeah and so that's made it very difficult to narrow down this list and I've been working on it for a long time so I've been kind of trying to get a broad spectrum of my overall feelings across lots of different moods and time but for the most part my main concern when making this list has been do I enjoy the game do I have fun playing it? When I play it, is it like, oh my god, the game's over already? And do I just actively right now go, yeah, I'll sit and play that. If someone brought that to the table, do I go, yeah, I want to play that. And that is what this is a list of games of. Now, the 10 to 1 is kind of just how much I react that way. These are all amazing games, and there are plenty of others that could, if these games didn't exist, have made this list. But... Without further ado, let's get on with it. At number 10, we have what I think is the newest game on this list, and that is King Domino by Blue Orange Games that came out in 2016. And this is just a completely lovely game. Everything about it is just fantastic and phenomenal. The component quality, the insert, everything, the artwork, you know, the wooden components, I love absolutely everything about it. It's got this cutesy loveliness about it that will mean that it appeals to a huge audience. And I just love the simplicity of this. The mechanics are engaging and interesting, but simple. Simple enough that they're really easy to teach. All you're trying to do is build your kingdom using these domino style pieces. Your have these numbered dominoes, you put them in order, obviously the higher the number, probably the more valuable the domino, but whoever's at the top gets the first choice, so this guy will go, I'll go there, and then they add this tile to their kingdom, and then, oh, he can go here, and then I'm left with only these two to choose from, because I went for these big expensive ones, but you know, these ones were really valuable to me because I already had water and woodland. And the whole idea is you're trying to have blocks of the same terrain type. But they'll only score if they have crowns. So you need to make sure that you're also having crowns there. And you've got a restriction on the shape of your kingdom. So in kind of most games, you'll be doing 5x5. Five However, you can do a two-player variant where you do a 7x7 seven seven grid. You're not restricted to keep your castle in the centre, but I really like to. And I like to try and make sure that my kingdom is complete, because it is possible that your draft tiles that you're not able to place. So that is the game. That is how simple it is. And then you just put out new tiles and you repeat that draft. I really enjoy the whole drafting mechanic. I think it works really well in this with regards to the balancing of the value of the tile compared to your ability to then choose first on the next draft. I think that works fantastically well. It's very simple, it's very elegant, and it's just so quick to play, so easy to play, that I'll always happily bring out King Domino by Blue Orange Games. Number nine is the only party game on this list, or large group game anyway. And that is Codenames by Czech Games Edition. And this is a fantastic game. I really love it. It plays quick. Again, the same as King Domino. It's one of these games I can easily get to the table. And that's a big part of it. You know, there's so many people that you can play this with who will play it. You can play a two-player variant as well. And, yeah, it's just, I really love it. The whole idea of the game is it's just word association. You have this randomly generated 5x5 five five grid of words. And you have a key code. Now, 
this is a team game. You have a red team and a blue team. Who goes first is denoted by the outside edge. And then you're trying to get your colours guessed by the other players. But there is also an assassin that if any team guesses, they immediately lose. So the whole idea is it's a race to be the first. You're trying to do the most associations with a single clue. And your clue can only be one word. And then you say how many cards in the grid associate to that. So you'd say potato two and looking at these words that would probably be kind of useless but then you know the people on your team will discuss and they can't see this they have no idea what the real answers are who's a what they're just going off what you give them the information you give them and they'll be there they'll discuss it and eventually they'll point to one and based on the grid you'll put the color marker down if it's yours great they can continue guessing if it's not, they have to stop. If it's the other teams, then that's not so bad. You know, okay, you've given the other team a point. Even better would be an innocent bystander. You don't even give the other team another point. But the assassin would lose you the game. And it's that simple. And that is why I love this. I just, I can play it with anyone. It's not difficult. It can be quite finky at times. Rarely is there a case of this has not gone down well. You get lots of laughter, discussion, on why were you thinking that? And yeah, I just, I absolutely love Codenames by Check Games Edition. For number eight, it's enough of the light, easy to play games and on to Dead of Winter by Plaid Hat Games. Now, this is a game that has zombies in it, but I would in no way class it as a zombie game. You see, the zombies could be any sort of opponent, really. It doesn't feel like they need to be zombies. It very much is post-apocalyptic. It very much is a tense game about survival and the need to work together in order to achieve that survival, but with the tension of a possible betrayer in your midst. And that is what I love about this game. It just generates so many stories. The number of times you'll be like, oh, do you remember that game where you were the betrayer or where we thought you were a betrayer and you weren't because you were doing this or that? I absolutely love it. I have so much fun every time I play this game. And even playing it two player, you play it as a completely co-op. You have your mission, but your mission is harder. It is still a fun, tense, co-op game even knowing there's no betrayer you still don't know you're going to make it you still have to work together you still have to manage your actions and resources there is a huge amount going on in this game as you're searching through these various locations in order to find the things for your colony to survive and meet its mission and on top of that every round there are crises to deal with that will make it harder and this is one way in which the kind of betrayer mechanic because it's a secret betrayer you don't know who the betrayer is you're putting cards into this contribution basically you're having to contribute items and if you put the wrong item in it counts against the group and so you're very much paying attention to who's doing what who's putting what in kind of going okay well we need food can you go search here can you go search there and the locations are really great and thematic you go to the grocery store to find food you go to the police station to get weapons you go to the hospital for medicine absolutely fantastic game i really love it just so much going on so many kind of stories so oh uh, yeah you know you get no player elimination you can exile people you can go right we figured out you're the betrayer oh it turns out you won't hmm. but it doesn't matter and then they get a new objective and they can still potentially win the game and as well as everyone working together on an individual objective and potentially there being a betrayer they also have their own objectives so as well as that group one they have their own ones and this is great because any kind of suspicious behaviour, it's, well, is that just them trying to achieve their personal objectives so that they win the game? Or is it that they're the betrayer? And so that makes, yeah, it's just, I absolutely love it. And the one last thing to mention, that this was the first game I've encountered, at least doing this, was with the crossroad cards. They just add to that story and thematic element so much. Each turn, the player to your right is looking at this card and will tell you when it triggers. And it will have an effect that relates to what is going on in the game. 
And that is fantastic. And as well as having an effect and a story and a, a, something being said and done, it gives choices either to that single player or to the group doing a vote. Absolute love it. There's just, yeah, I always love getting this to the table and playing it. I have so much fun. And with these Crossroads cards, there's even an app available now that you can like play the cards. So rather than having the whole card in front of you, what happens is it's read out and you only know the bit that you know. And then you're making your decisions. You know the option, but you don't know what the outcome will be. And I think that's excellent because it means that your decision making is being done purely thematically and not from a well, I would like one extra food, or I would like an extra character, so I will make this decision. It's, oh, well, we really don't need people around at the moment and that someone's asking to join, or you don't, oh, we can't take the risk of them bringing disease in. Fantastic, absolutely love Dead of Winter by Plaid Hat Games. Number seven is Arctic Scavengers by Rio Grande Games, a deck builder, which is one of my favourite mechanics. I just really enjoy the choices that gives, but still with a level of randomness that makes for fantastic gameplay. And I think this is probably my favourite. I think, well, <laughs> it is my favourite. Spoiler alert, there's no other uh, deck builders, at least not true deck builders, in the rest of this list. And I love this. I think the post-apocalyptic theme is very good. I think it comes across well in the artwork. Nearly all the cards in this are multi-use, so you know you can see down here what you can use them as. Some boost other cards, and you've got junk which you can search through, and you might find completely useless stuff, or you might find weapons. I mean, and then you've got the contested resources that give you more points generally or they might be something super powerful and yeah it's just sometimes they're better than others and at different points in the game they're better so being able to look at those you're like oh, this is one I really want commit all my people to combat or you know you start buying lots of people for combat or you buy lots of diggers so you can dig through there because contested resources have gone in there absolutely love it I think the whole skirmish the digging through junk it just works really well as a game and the base game plus HQ plus recon means that you've got the expansions there giving great replay if you've got just the base game then the level of variation in the cards isn't great but what this adds above a lot of deck builders out there is it has that interaction a lot of deck builders can be very solitaire you're just doing what you're doing you know maybe you're attacking other people this, you've got to be aware of what other people are doing and adjusting to it in order to get the resources and make sure you're in a position to win the game. And I love the fact that the expansions add new ways to go about doing this with new types of units, with buildings, with your leaders and stuff like that. I think it's just really good as a game. I think, as I say, the interaction you get from the like bluffing of holding cards over for the skirmish and stuff is really good. I think it's definitely better with more players. I think three is probably my favourite. No, four is probably the favourite. Um, but it does work well as a two-player. The only thing is you lose a bit with not having someone get to peek at the contested resource. But you still have that contest going and that tug of war and that bluffing. Yeah, an absolutely fantastic deck builder. If you haven't checked it out, do take a look at Arctic Scavengers by Rio Grande Games. And we're sticking with deck builders for my favourite solo play game in at number six, Mage Knight by WizKids. Now... I say we're staying with deck builders. This isn't really a deck builder, but it does have a fair amount of deck building in. What it really feels like is an adventure dungeon crawly game, as you're using the cards in your hand that you're getting from your own personal deck, and each character has a slightly different deck with slightly different things they can do, which is really interesting to move around and fight enemies that are these tokens or go and complete missions or recruit people and you gain experience which is also your points and as you gain experience and points you move along the track and as you move down rows on the track then you level up and there are two different ways to level up in this which is really good you've got one way you just kind of take a token off and you're able to recruit a new unit now if you go to the right place but it also increases either your armor making you harder to take damage or increases your hand size which gives you more options and speaking of options that's one thing this game does not lack and that's one thing I absolutely love about it every turn is a puzzle because you're given a hand of cards and you're looking at that going I know what I want to do 
well, I could use this card for the top ability or the lower ability. I could use this one for the top or low ability. So I use my low ability to move, and then I'll use this card to attack. Although, oh, I need to defend, or it doesn't give enough attack, but you can always play a card face down as one of anything, meaning that there's so much versatility in how you can use the cards in the order that you use them to move around, to attack in this fantasy adventure landscape. Absolutely love it. The randomness of the tokens means that you're always fighting different enemies. The randomness of the tiles with the two different types of tiles means that you always start off in the easier area and then move into a harder area. But what's going to be in that area, what that area is going to be, where the tiles are going to be appearing is not fixed, which gives a great amount of replay value as well. There are two different types of units and the units you can choose to use and they give you a boost and you're using things. You've got night and day, which is a really interesting mechanic where certain magic works better in night or better in day and you get these different kind of special power cards that you can use that are different for night and different for day and they also dictate turn order now i will say obviously i'm gushing there's a lot to cover i love it but it is very long a game of this solo will take me about two hours playing with another person about four hours so I will never play this with more than two people really because it just takes too long typically missions that you're trying to do is going to be finding one of these hero clicksy castle cities here and taking them over before the timer runs out and the time is fixed by a number of rounds now the components in this are lovely and that really helps you've got this kind of almost tacky plastic crystals but it works great and they give lego a run for their money as the arch nemesis of feet you've got the lovely little dice for your mana you've got skills that you can pick up as you level up as well there is just so much going up and of course being that you have your own personal deck and being that there is deck building in here you are able to add cards to your deck Firstly, you can pick up spells, and those will give you mighty magics to use, or you can pick up artifacts that are these rare, unique items, and you can also just get like special abilities that you add into your deck. And you'll be gaining these as you level up, as you achieve things, as you defeat things, but you can also get wounds which clog up your deck and then you need to heal in order to get those out and if your hand gets filled with wounds then you're incapacitated and you need to rest absolutely think this is a fantastic game I think every turn, every game, you're just engaged and excited and you're just spending your time working out exactly what you're going to do how you're going to do it and then seeing it all come off as you work as you storm your way across the uh, landscape and beat up these mystical creatures. That's, uh, yeah, Mage Knight, my favourite solo game, and my number six game of all time by WizKids. At number five, we have the plastic-filled marvel Blood Rage by Cool Mini or Not, or Simon as they're now known. And I just absolutely love this. I love the feel of the game, I love these monsters, and you clip the base on, and you launch it down. It's just a fantastic experience. But what this game is, is an area control game with drafting. And drafting and area control are mechanics that I enjoy, and I think they work very well together. I mean, obviously, <laughs> King Domino has been on the list, that's been drafting already and now we've got more drafting so evidently I definitely do you'll get these cards and these cards will allow you to do various things such as battling each other completing quests to gain glory or upgrading troops or gaining monsters and it's just so much fun to play this to have these figures to be putting them down but at the same time it's not just this Ameritrash pointless yeah all flair no substance to it this game has a lovely amount of strategy in what cards do you choose to draft? Do you choose to draft something because you know it will be beneficial to the strategy that someone else is playing? Do you draft what you need for your strategy? Do you draft things just, yeah, just because it sounds so cool? I mean, yeah, I just love this. It's great.
great having the minis, it's great plonking them down, it's great to play with these, and the game as a whole is just so much fun as you're battling through Ragnarok and sending your people to die, and dying isn't the end of the world in this, and yeah, it's just so much fun. This is evidently the area control part of the list, because at number four we have Komet by Matago, and I absolutely love this just as much as I love Blood Rage, especially these two. It's been very hard to decide which one I do prefer, and I think Komet just edged it out just slightly. I think this is a superb game. Rather than drafting, here the main mechanics, other than the area control, you've got action selection with this pyramid mechanic here, whereby you have to use an action from each level, but uh, yeah, you can use multiple on one level because you've got five actions and there's only three levels. And it's got this prayer mechanic that you're using as a kind of engine building almost. As you build up your pyramids that allow you to take more powerful tiles of the corresponding colour. So you've got the white is kind of support colour really. It kind of evolves around gaining more prayer points to be able to spend to do more things. Blue is very much defence focused and then red is attack focused and attacking is very important in this game. More so than in Blood Rage, surprisingly given the nature of the games and the names. But that's part of what kind of pushes this over. I mean in this the tie break is points one through battle and the it's kind of you can't really win by losing in this in blood rage you can take the i want to die route and win and i do like that and i like that in this you don't have that and i like that in both of these games they can scale well yeah oh, i always yo-yo between them as i say they've both got fantastic miniatures of monsters that i just love to get out as quickly as I can really you know you just want to rush get the monsters get monsters on the board because they just have such a lovely visual impact and yeah this game though it just just kind of pushes above I, I do love it I love the combat in this I love the fact that you have an almost bluffing element of you playing your card but you can hide your divine intervention cards underneath I think that's very good. I think the fact that otherwise, without take, you've got a kind of overbid a bit maybe with your combat because of those divine intervention cards, but otherwise you know what's going to be played. And you know that if you keep attacking people, because you don't get cards back immediately, you'll know you're using up those cards, you know what they're going to have until you know, they run out of cards. And every time they do a combat, they've got to get rid of a card. And you don't know what one they've got rid of, though. So, yeah, I think it's an absolutely superb game. Uh, Comet by Matago. Fantastic area control, engine building, and action selection game. From games filled with plastic to games filled with wood. At number three, we have Terra Mystica by Z-Man Games. And this... It's just filled with wood. It's the heaviest game on the list. There is so much going on in this game, so many different options, and that gives it a huge amount of replay value. The fact that there are so many different routes to victory, different ways you can go about getting that victory. The fact that you have randomized bonus points for each round, each game. So it's gonna work differently based on what you're trying to do each round. And the fact that you have a need to build it next to each other because you have this power mechanic whereby if someone builds near you you get power so you need to be near them so that if they build up you can get the power and the power will allow you to do things whereas if you run off and do go off on your own you're not going to have that and that means that despite the board not changing for the number of players it still scales very well for the number of players as you want to be in close com not combat really because you're not fighting but what you are doing is terraforming hence terra mystica because it's mystical and terraforming you can only build on a certain color of hex but you can change the color of hex by terraforming spaces and thereby being able to put your buildings on and when you put a building out it uncovers income 
and the income could be workers, it could be money, it could be priests, you know, depending on the building. But then as you upgrade a building to put a better building out that will give you a different type of income, you're then covering up your previous income. And that, again, it's just such a fantastic mechanic. I think this is a fantastic game. It is really heavy. It takes a long time to play. It can take a long time to get used to how to play. But, yeah, just so much fun to play. So engaging an experience. But without feeling like you have no direction and no idea what to do each game. And still playable in around an hour and a half to two hours, especially with two players. That's uh, Terra Mystica by Z-Man Games, my number three game. At number two, we have the vibrant and gorgeous Seasons. This game is absolutely fantastic. This is drafting. That is all this game really comes down to. Drafting with a little bit of engine building in there. The whole game, you start by drafting cards. So you draft nine cards and then you assign these cards to one of the three years and that's when you'll get access to those cards. You'll start the round by rolling the dice for the season that you're in and there's this rundown mechanic where as the game progresses you move around into the different seasons and into the different years and the game ends once you've finished the third year. After you've rolled the dice you'll then Starting with your first player, pick a dice. Once everyone's picked a dice, you then resolve a dice. What these dice will generally do is give you energy tokens, which relate to the elements, and certain elements are more available in certain seasons. And those energy tokens you will use to summon the monsters from your hands. These will then give you powers. They might be one-shot powers, they might be recurring powers, or they might simply give you points, because that's the main thing these cards are going to do, give you end game points, the most important thing anyway. Some will give you ways of getting points throughout the game, which is another thing you can do with your dice. Some of the dice results will allow you to turn energy into points, and certain energy is worth more points in different seasons. What I love about this game is that it's not a complex game, it's not difficult, it's beautiful, it's tactile, the dice, the big chunky dice, but it's engaging and your decisions matter. But you can also change your decisions based off what happens on the dice and what happens as you get your cards available, you can be like, okay, well I was going to play that then, I'll play it now. And the fact that you have to kind of preempt how the game's going to go can mean that you end up with cards not necessarily the most useful to you. But you can get more cards during the game from some of the dice faces and some of the card effects. And this game involves a lot of comboing with those cards. And that's where the kind of engine building aspect of this can come in. Because you can have cards which kick off other cards and help other cards. Or cards that will give you things that will help you get towards getting other cards out. It's just a lovely game, it's great fun, it plays different every game, and there's just a ton of cards that means there's a load of variety in the game. The one thing I will say is that downtime can be an issue with certain players. I would tend to prefer to play this with three players or less, and I think it works absolutely fabulously as a two-player game. That is Seasons, my number two game of all time. And my number one game is of no surprise to anyone who follows the channel. And as you can see, just by looking at the sheer number of boxes I have for it, it's a pretty clear cut winner. And that is Arcadia Quest by Call Mini or Not, who are the only publisher, I believe, to have two games on this list. So congratulations to them on that. I obviously uh, very much like their games, or at least very much like awesome looking plastic miniatures, which is very true to be honest. So what can I say about Arcadia Quest? Why do I love it so much? Well, it's just pure fun. I just find it so much fun. I grew up playing D&D, doing role play games on computer games as well. I love the whole dungeon crawl aspect and I love that this takes a dungeon crawl and makes it competitive that you have your own guild that you feel like you're dungeon crawling with and as you play through the campaign and you're getting new equipment it feels a bit like they're leveling up I just absolutely love it I love the fact that 
at any point you could win with the exploding dice. You just never know what could happen. But at the same time, there is strategy in this of which quests you go after first, of how do you use special abilities, of how what equipment you choose to draft and buy, and how you connect and chain abilities, how you choose to move people out, who you move out first, whether you try to create a line of people to prevent payback reactions and things like that. There is just so much going on in this. There's a huge amount of quantity that obviously I would have loved to get out and show you everything there is, but it won't even fit on the table, frankly. <laughs> I have so much for it. Obviously, I have here Arcadia Quest, the expansion for Arcadia Quest, the second expansion for Arcadia Quest, the standalone expansion, Arcadia Quest Inferno, and then a load of Kickstarter exclusives and dragons, and yeah, yeah I've got so much here. And I absolutely love the game. I just find moving around, just the fun of it, of attacking your friends, of attacking monsters, collecting gold, spending gold, drafting, which as you've seen is a key mechanic for me. I really enjoy drafting and it includes that in the game. And yeah, it's just, oh, I just love it. Arcadia Quest, for me, is the best game. There's just so much fun to it. Every, even You can even play the same campaigns through time and time again. You've got different heroes you can use. Even if you're using the same combination of heroes, it will play out differently due to the randomness of the dice. And you can kind of get better at campaigns as you get more used to it. Right, well, if I go after this, I can know to clear this, etc. Yeah, I think Arcadia Quest is a fantastic game. I love it to bits. I have got everything I possibly could. I think all the expansions add really nice elements and just improve the game. And yeah, the components are fantastic. Yeah, Arcadia Quest by Call Me or Not, my favorite game of all time. I do hope that you've enjoyed this video. Of course, I've not gone into a lot of detail on basically any of these games because I've tried to keep this short and just kind of give you why I love the game so much, um, give you a little overview, a little look at them. But I have done videos for all these games, so if you do want to learn more, do check out the rest of the videos on the channel. You can see more about these games and just what makes them so fantastic, so brilliant. I would recommend anyone to try any of these games. And yeah, I hope this has been a useful video for you. I do hope you've enjoyed it and we'll check out the rest of the videos on the channel. And as always, thanks for watching and bye for now.